At long last, we come to the Gaussian process regression model and how to do inference in this model. Now, as usual, in regression, we have some observed data at some x's and xi's and yi's that are observed, and this model is no different. So let's write down, we have some x's, and let's say, let's actually break them up into x1 to xl and xl plus 1 up to xn. And for notational reasons that will become apparent, you may already be able to guess why. Let's say that we observe yl plus 1 up to yn. So these are observed. Observed. And we'd like to get the posterior predictive distribution on the y's corresponding to x1 up to xl, given these y's, given yl plus 1 up to yn. So, uh, so we want to get the distribution on these y's, given those. So let's call these, so let's, following our notation to fit with our notation in the previous video, let's call these, these y's yb, and let's call these ya. So here a and b, just to be, maybe to be clear, a is going to be 1 up to l, and b, l plus 1 up to n. All right. So I said the posterior predicted distribution, but under what model? Well, as usual, we're going to have some random variables. I'll stop writing all the intermediate ones. Well, maybe I'll, I'll write them for now, just to be, just to be clear. No, I'll, okay, so you get the point. So that's, we're gonna have y1 up to yn. And what distribution are we going to put on these random variables? These y's are, are obviously going to model their corresponding these observations and these these are unobserved maybe i should make that clear these are unobserved so these are not actually necessarily values that um that uh, these are taking the, we're going to use this ya to denote possible values that these random variables y1 up to yl could take Okay, so now we need a distribution on these y's, and what are we going to take? Well, we're going to use a Gaussian process to define this. So we are going to take z, let's say zx, to be a Gaussian process, which I'll abbreviate gp, with mean function mu and covariance function k. So it has this positive semi-definite kernel. And then we're going to look at these. For each x here, we're going to consider the value of this Gaussian process at that x. So this is a so this is a GP on R D. I didn't say, but I should have said these x's are going to be. Well, actually, I guess they don't even need to be. Yeah, they don't even need to be on R D. These can just be in some arbitrary set s so this is a, a gp on some set s and these these y's are going to be in r and now so we still haven't defined the y's what are the y's well the y's are going to be uh y i let me use yellow to be consistent y i is going to be z x i plus some random some gaussian uh noise epsilon so epsilon now so epsilon is going to be a vector epsilon one up to epsilon what do we need n epsilon is a multivariate normal with mean zero and covariance matrix sigma squared i And epsilon is also independent of, so this is epsilon, is independent of our Gaussian process zx. Okay. So this is our model. This is the Gaussian process regression model. And note that this s is just some arbitrary set. So this is, boom, 
this whole thing. This is our model. And now what do we want to do? In order to do inference, we want to get the posterior predictive distribution on uh, for on these these random variables y1 through yl given these observed values. These are the observed values. So let's write down what we want. So we want for inference, maybe I'll put inference. So that was the model. This is inference. So we want to get this. We want to get P Y A given Y B. And this also, of course, depends on X's. But let's just drop the dependence on X's because these are just some fixed, you know, these X's are just some fixed non-random things. These aren't random, so we don't need to include them in our probabilities. So what is this thing? Well, this is where the key step in our calculation in the previous video comes into play. So in the previous video, we talked about how we had this setup where we had this, this, mul this Gaussian vector Z and this Gaussian epsilon. We added them together. We got Y. And then we were able to figure out what the conditional distribution on YA given YB was. So what's the corresponding thing here? Well, we have this yi plus zxi plus epsilon. So this looks very similar. And in fact, we have y, the vector of y's, this is y, let's call that y, is equal to, let's call z tilde, the vector of z's, plus this vector epsilon. So this will be, let's make a little space for it. Let's make a little space here. This let's call z tilde, so we don't get confused by thinking that it's our Gaussian process. So z tilde is just this vector of random variables that the Gaussian process, uh, the, you know, the finite dimensional distribution, this, this, this vector at these finitely many points. And so we have this, and now we're back in the familiar situation of just having a multivariate Gaussian. We have this this z tilde because z x here this this family of of random variables is a gaussian process z tilde is a multivariate gaussian that's just the definition of a gaussian process and epsilon is by definition a also a gaussian and they are independent they are independent and so we are just back in this nice nice simple case well somewhat simple case simpler case y equals z plus epsilon except it's z tilde now and so we get the the distribution here so what what do we need we need to get the k matrix and the the mu vector for z so maybe let's first do that epsilon here is just the same as as below so let's figure out what the mu and k are here well we want to get so we want to get the distribution so we have z tilde, maybe let's switch. z tilde, we know, is multivariate Gaussian. And let's call its mean vector mu tilde and its covariance matrix k. And mu tilde, this is just the vector of means of these random variables. And what is that? Well, the mean of this first one is just mu of x1, right? That's the definition of, of, you know, using the mu, where mu is the, is this mean function. That's the definition of the mean function for a Gaussian process. It gives you the mean of each of these random variables. So this mu is just mu x1 up to mu xn, where mu is our mean function. Let's make that transpose just to make it a column vector. And What's the K matrix? What's the covariance matrix of this Z tilde? Well, it's just using the kernel of this, using the, the covariance function of this Gaussian process. It's just, just K evaluated at the pairs XI and XJ. That's the definition of, because, you know, the covariance matrix is just the matrix, matrix of the covariances between zxi and zxj 
and the covariance of zxi and zxj is from the from the formulation of the gaussian process is just just that kernel evaluated at those two points so the covariance matrix is this k where k i j maybe i'll put it, let me rearrange slightly let's call k i j the kernel evaluated at x i and x j and then k will be the matrix of k i j's and let's partition this into k or maybe i'm jumping the gun let's we'll, we'll come back to this uh, that in a second okay so so we're we're in getting in in pretty good shape now we've got this z tilde we have our our y is is z tilde plus epsilon remember we're trying to get just we're trying to get this posterior predictive distribution that's our our ultimate goal and so we're going to use the key step here we've got our our k matrix we've got our mu vector let's you know mu tilde now whatever and so now we know from this earlier video that the distribution of y is this with mu tilde here and we know immediately we did all the work before that this conditional distribution is this is this normal with with mean m and covariance matrix d so let's write down what what this is so we we have this let's maybe define what these mu a and and k a b's are and all so we have mu tilde we can break up into mu tilde a and or maybe i'll just call it let me just call it mu a so simplify life a little bit where of course mu a is just mu x1 up to mu xl that's following this this earlier sort of notation and we can also break up k into the block matrix just like before k a a k a b b k b a k b b okay and we know from here that the conditional distribution of y a given y b equals little b is this guy is just this so our so that and that's what we wanted we wanted this posterior predictive distribution so we go we know that let's use a color y a given that y b takes the observed values y b remember we had these observed values y b and this the conditional distribution of this is normal that's so in other words this probability is the density of a normal with the following mean and covariance function mean vector and covariance function so this is equal to we have our answer this equals normal density evaluated at y a with mean m and a covariance matrix d where they're just exactly so i've chosen the notation so that everything works out perfectly here so let me just I'll just copy and paste just to emphasize since we had some slight changes and slight changes in notation Ooh, actually let's move down here first just to emphasize that this is the formula these are the formulas that we wanted it is exactly this okay so we've got it And that is literally all there is to it. Let me just clean this up a little bit. That is all there is to it. So that is how to do inference in the Gaussian process regression model, how to get the posterior, in particular, how to get the posterior predictive distribution, which is the main type of inference that you're interested in. And um, so maybe I'll make a couple of remarks about how you would actually 
use this in practice? Well, if you're just interested in visualizing this, this posterior distribution, if you're interested in making predictions, like maybe you had, so maybe you had, draw some, some data here. If you had some data and you're, you're interested in getting the values at some, some new predicting values at some new points, something like this. Well, then one thing you could do would be uh, to, to just plot the curve uh, of this, this posterior mean, you know, or you could plot the, the mean just at those points, but you would, you would get some, you know, maybe some curve, something like that. And that would be okay for just visualizing this, but that's just sort of the most rudimentary application because you're not really taking advantage of the fact that you've got the whole posterior distribution. You've got the whole shebang. So a, a more intelligent thing to do would be to actually, a slightly more intelligent thing to do would be to use, you know, to indicate maybe with some error bars or something. So this is going to be small, small error here, bigger, and then it's going to be small, bigger error. You could use some error bars, something like that. But even still, that's just really, I mean, it's good for visualization, very good for visualization to see what the posterior distribution looks like. But the best way, you know, the best use of this, this model would be if you, you know, if you're really going to use it to make a decision about something, if you're going to have to decide something, then you should choose a loss function, which is appropriate for your application. And then you can actually use the full power of this post of this posterior distribution to minimize your expected loss. So that would be the most intelligent use of, uh, you know, the fact that you have a whole, you know, Bayesian model here. I mean, that's a, that's a nice thing. You should, so you should use that to do what you actually really want to do. So that's how you do inference. And so what were the, what did we have to choose? What did we have to, what decisions did we have to make in order to, to apply this, to, to set up this model? Well, basically everything was, 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 is determined by this, this formulation, except for this mean and covariance function. So these are your parameters in some sense. These are, these are the choices that you can make. And also, I mean, you could also, yeah, I mean, this is sort of a, you know, less important parameter, but the, the main thing that you're choosing is this mean function and covariance function. And you can choose these, you know, using your domain knowledge about the particular application that you're, you're doing a regression for. You can choose these, these mean, and especially the covariance function. That's really, really uh, um, most important perhaps to, to fit, you know, uh, or to make sense for the, the application that you're considering. And it's cool that you can actually even have certain constraints on the functions that you're willing to consider, like they have to be symmetric or periodic or blah, blah, blah. And you can actually use your domain knowledge about what, you're, what you want the functions that you're using for regression to look like in order to govern this Gaussian process. So that's a nice thing. That's a, that's a very nice thing. And of course, you could always choose these to give you the same, you know, choose the kernel that, that corresponded to the Bayesian linear regression kernel that we derived earlier. And so this all generalizes Bayesian linear regression. Now this, so this, this Gaussian process for regression is in some sense, it, I mean, this is a really extraordinarily useful tool, I think. And it's perhaps what, perhaps the most most powerful general purpose tool, the most useful uh, for, for applications, general purpose tool that we've talked about so far.